I'm Michael Bain and welcome to Triggered, coming to you from Dragon House Studios in the secret hidden bunker in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, where luckily it's not on fire this year. Well, it's not on fire yet, anyway. Of course, we are brought to you by Midway USA, just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. And today's show is a little bit of a potpourri, if you will, kind of a show and tell collection on some ongoing projects. The first thing I want to show you here is this rifle, this lever action rifle, is a Henry Long Ranger. It is a box fed lever action rifle designed for modern cartridges. You can get it in 223, 243, 308, or just like this one in 6.5 Creedmoor. It's a gun I've really been looking forward to working with. It's taken me a little bit of time to get one here. As you guys probably remember, I'm in the process of working on a book on the lever action rifle in the 21st century. Because one of the things that I find fascinating is lever action rifle technology essentially was hammered out in the Civil War. You know, of course, by the end of the Civil War, lever rifle technology was pretty much where it is now. Of course, there's changes in metallurgy, there's changes in manufacturing, but if you took a Civil War troopie, a Confederate or a Union soldier, and you handed them a modern lever action rifle, they would understand how it works. They would know what to do with it. They could load it. They could shoot you with it, depending on which side you were on. But the drawback for lever guns was always they had a tube magazine. We've talked about that before. In a tubular magazine, that means that one, the nose of one bullet is against the butt of the other bullet, right smack on the primer. Now, I guess you could call this part a PSA. I've recently read on the internet where the idea of a case touching off a primer under recoil in a lever action rifle was an old wives tale and that nobody should ever pay any attention to it because it has never happened. And then they said, if you can find me one credible person that's seen it happen, I'll change my mind. I saw it happen. I'm the guy that had to call the ambulance at an event we did years ago with a 45 Colt lever action, I believe it was 1873, 45 Colt replica, and the rounds were just a little pointed, and I expressed concern about that. The owner of the rifle said, I've shot a zillion of these and nothing ever happens. Well, unfortunately, at about the zillionth and third, the tube went off. It fired three rounds in the tube. It blew the tube apart, blew the forend apart, badly cut the shooter's front hand, because the shooter's front hand wrapped around the forend, forend blew up. So, if you've read on the internet that you don't have to worry about pointy cartridges in a lever action tubular magazine, pay no attention. There's no sense going to the emergency room because you believe some moron on Facebook, okay? Anyway, the drawback was always a tubular magazine. And of course, John Browning was perfectly aware of that. And in 1894, Browning put together what would be his 1895 lever gun. And it was a box-fed magazine to be able to take advantage of mod more modern cartridges. Uh, smokeless powder, invented in the 1880s, mid-1880s, had started to be available for military weapons. And the very first sporting cartridge, for example, in with smokeless powder was, of course, the Winchester 3030 for the Winchester 94. The smokeless 3030 was introduced in 1895. And interesting story we showed on the old Cowboys show is who took big advantage of the smokeless powder first? Outlaws. And they took advantage of it because they could hide up in the rocks like in all those westerns and shoot the people coming toward them. And the people coming toward them couldn't see where the bullets were coming from because there was this huge cloud of smoke. But so Browning invented 1895 to take advantage not just of smokeless powder, but the new Spitzer cartridges. That is, they're really pointy. They buck the wind better. They have better aerodynamics, better ballistics than anything with a round, big round nose or big flat nose. So with the 1895, Browning saw it as a military weapon, but for at least the United States, it didn't pan out that way. Hang on a second. When we come back, I'm going to keep talking a little bit about the Henry Long Ranger.
Welcome back to Triggered, where we've been talking about this gun. It is a Henry Long Ranger lever action rifle in 6.5 Creedmoor. Let me give you some quick specs about this specific gun before we talk a little bit more on the history of uh, magazine fed lever actions. Uh, as I said, it's available in 6.5 Creedmoor. It's also available in 308, 243, and 223. You can get a shorter barrel, 20 inch barrel with um, no sights on it anyway. Obviously, you're going to put a scope on it as I am on this gun. Uh, this particular barrel is 22 inches. It uses this magazine. So we're talking about not a huge capacity, four round capacity total. Magazine obviously fits right in here. There is a mag button on the right side. Let me show you that really quickly. This is the button that releases the magazine. And you'll also, this is a geared system. Typically with like earlier lever actions, you've got kind of a Rube Goldberg uh, head bone connected to the neck bone, connected to the knee bone set of links. But this one, I don't know if you can see inside very clearly there, but it is a geared system. When you rack it here, you'll notice the trigger stays with it. Why do I bring that up? Because on a Browning BLR, Browning lever action, the only other currently available magazine-fed lever-action rifle, the trigger comes down with it. And a lot of people go, like, that's weird. It's to keep you from getting pinched. Um, I've shot a lever-action enough times that I don't get pinched unless it's a shotgun. And then <laughs> all bets are off the table. I think it's uh, six lugs. So you've got a very modern design rifle. You're looking at it and you're going like, where'd they put the safety button that you should never have on a lever gun because you don't need it. In this case, they have a transfer system, a hammer-based transfer system, just like you would see in a double action revolver. So the gun can't fire till you pull the trigger because part of pulling the trigger pushes the transfer bar up so the hammer can make contact with Mr. Firing Pin. Makes perfectly good sense. The trigger on this gun is pretty good. Now, by pretty good, I'm going to say three and a half, three, seven, five pounds. It's, you know, one of the things I found with Henry's in general is it's not fair to judge the trigger when you get them out of the box because Henry's shoot in. You know, give 20, 30, 40, 50 rounds through this gun, you're going to start seeing it. Uh, I, I use the phrase settle down, and the trigger is going to lighten up a little as everything smooths out. Other interesting, interesting parts of this gun is it is, of course, drilled and tapped for scopes. I have an EGW pick rail that's going to go on top. And last week at the Comp Expo, week and a half ago at the Comp Expo, I talked to Night Force and they said, hey, let us send you a scope for you to do all your long range testing on this gun. I'm curious about what I can get out of this gun. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things about it. Um, and I want to find that out. You know, I want to see what it looks like at three and 400 yards. I know 300 yards is easy, 200 yards I can, we can get here at the secret hidden bunker. But I'm really interested in trying out at that with, I don't know, a higher power scope, four to 20, uh, six to 24, fill in the blank. If I was to use this as a hunting gun, what scope would I put on it? Anybody raise their hand? I would go with a one to six, one to eight. Why? Because I'm not a huge fan of long distance hunting. And when I've had to, in the field, been forced to take a long shot, it's never been with like a great big scope. Well, in one case it was. But usually it's, it's a lower powered hunting scope. Uh, even a three to nine, one to six, one to four. And the, in fact, the longest shot I've ever made on game is, is a 500 yard shot with a one to five. So a one to, one to six, one to eight would be perfect for a 6.5 in this platform. So I'm going to be shooting it more. We're going to be doing the accuracy test. I've got a lot of 6.5 Creed around here, including 6.5 uh, six Creed Match, which is really an excellent, excellent ammunition. Price, around $1,100. Um, maybe $100, $150, $200 lower than the Browning BLR, which is in limited production. There are production versions of the Browning BLR available but once again, it's a crapshoot. As you know, when I got my 405 uh, uh, Winchester, I, I, I say Winchester Browning interchangeably, it is the same company. But um, the Winchester 1895 and 405 is in limited availability, and 30 out 6 limited availability. The Browning BLR in multiple calibers is in limited availability. These guys 
You can get one tomorrow afternoon. So we'll take it out to the range. We'll start doing some shooting with it. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the second generation of red dots. This week's Trigger is brought to you by Midway USA. Just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. Taurus USA, designed to protect. Rock Island Arms Corps, solid as a rock. And Franklin Armory, making some of the most innovative guns in America. Welcome back to Triggered, where now we're going to talk a little bit about this red dot sight. It is the Burris Fast Fire 4, that is, the fourth generation of the Fast Fire red dot sight. And you saw the Burris people like talk a little bit about functions and features last week at Comp Expo, but when I came back from Comp Expo, as if by hand of the occult, I had one of these waiting for me. And First, I want to say, you know, a lot of times I'll say, and you've heard me say this, especially on the podcast, when people send me a note and say, well, you know, so-and-so on the Internet said blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, really, I don't care at all. Um, there's only a handful of people whose opinion I, I absolutely unconditionally respect when it comes to guns. Two of those people are Patrick Kelly, uh, great three-gun master, and Mark Passamanic, three-gun master, um, uh, match director, designer. Both of them went out of their way to tell me how much they liked the Fast Fire 4. They were two of Burris's crash test dummies. And both of them, without talking to each other, came to me and said, have you got a Fast Fire 4 yet? They have really taken this site the next step up. Interestingly enough, Fast Fire was always, um, I guess the way to say it would be the bread and butter site, because it was, it was one you could afford, you know, two, three hundred bucks, versus what you're going to see with an aim point or what you're going to see with an RMR. And one of the things that I've been working on, uh, that I'm working on for Shooting Gallery and for Triggered, is looking at the second generation of red dot sights. Because essentially the Fast Fire 4, um, Aimpoint P2, RMR, their little sights, CC, and uh, the RMR SRO, their competition sights, uh, the Max, the, the, of the sights coming from Sig Sauer, including the Romeo Max, the one designed by Max Michel, I think of these as the second generation, the modern iteration of the red dot sight as it has evolved forward. The thing that sets this sight apart is multiple different reticles. You've got four reticles. And so you can choose those, uh, a little dot, you know, three MOA dot, uh, what, 11 MOA dot, a dot and a donut, circle and then a dot and a donut with little hash marks, uh, horizontal hash marks on it. Now, I had never used multiple reticle guns until I started using, uh, first, I, I think a sight mark I used that had um, a lower price sight mark that I used that had interchangeable reticles. And finally, I, I used interchangeable reticles from a hollow sun and I shot a competition with a hollow sun uh, that involved a lot of steel, a rimfire challenge competition, and I liked it which I didn't expect to. I went into it going like, this is going to suck. This is going to be one of those functions and features that you go like, yeah, thanks for painting racing stripes on the Cadillac. But what I found was with, with those four reticles, I could indeed choose the reticle I needed for a specific stage. If it's close in steel, I like circle and dot. I, because why? Because I can see it quicker. My old eyes can pick up the circle and dot quicker. And I'm just going from plate to plate to plate to plate to plate. If you say, I need you to shoot a longer shot in this stage, or I have to make a longer shot, well, then I want to go to the smallest dot I can get. In fact, on my 1895 Winchester, which is at the gunsmiths right now, it is being fitted with a one MOA dot. You're like, well, why would you pick a little bitty dot like that? Because <laughs> it's a rifle. It's not a competition gun. It's a hunting gun. So I just wanted to give you a heads up here. One thing I, I really did want to mention, uh, I think one of the things that sets this apart is it gives you the option to have a completely covered emitter, which may or may not work depending on the gun. This is a Glock uh, Gen 5 Model 34, plain as dirt. And you know, the MOS Glocks, they have this plate here, so you can pick whatever red dot sight you want by changing the plate. This is a Glock plate. Typically, I use plates from uh, CH Precision Weaponry, and in fact, I'm going to order a Burris plate today from them. But one thing you'll see is just the way the Glock sits with its MOS guns is I'm not being able to get that, that cover on it totally. I might have to do a little dinking because I would like to have the emitter permanently colored. 
Uh, you know, I've shot matches in the rain, and in fact, when it rains, ha ha, it does get down in here, and, and you do get a little bit of water there on the emitter and on the window. Also comes, by the way, with uh, a really nice, they always did nice pick rounds at Burris. It's a, it's a really good mount. And um, this is the absolutely necessary thing in the whole wide world is a screwdriver to adjust those little screws on the side and a bigger screwdriver because if you look here you will see that the battery is on top and it's a little bit easier to change than if you have to pull these two screws and change it on the bottom. One of the things I really like about this site is the window and if you look you can see that this is a bit of a larger window than I've seen on the other fast fires. It's also one of the things that sets aside what I think of as a generation two red dot sights. Bigger window makes it a little bit easier to use, especially if you're sequencing target to target to target like you may well do in a match or if you're caught in a riot. Anyway, I'm gonna take both of the guns we've talked about today out and shoot them. Uh, I'd love to shoot this gun in a match. I haven't shot a USPSA match in a year and a year and a half. I don't even remember 2020. I don't know what I did in 2020, but it went away. Okay, that is about it for this week. I've got uh, a couple of more guns I need to pick up that you're going to be really uh, go like, wow, that's really cool. So I'll be collecting those up. I'll be shooting more guns here. And by the way, I'm in the process of putting together a Magnum revolver challenge for the next Compex. It'll be a demo sport the first year. So you'll get to see people shoot great big revolvers. It's going to be fun. I'm Michael Bain. This is MBTV on the radio brought to you by Midway USA. Just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. You can find us on michaelbain.tv. You can find us on YouTube. And now, very first week, you can find us on Rumble. In short, we're ready to rumble. And when you find us on Rumble, it's Michael Bain's Triggered. That will get you there. It's easy to sign up. Push the button that says subscribe. We'll see you next week.